We hope you enjoy the content that we're trying to bring to you. Don't forget, new episodes will be released every Monday. You can find us on the iTunes Store, Spotify, and if you want to see the video, you can see it on our YouTube channel, PCT Football Coaching. On our latest episode, we have the pleasure of speaking to Noel Dempsey. Noel has a vast experience within coach education and also football coaching. So without further ado, um, Noel, how are you today, my friend? Uh, I'm all right, buddy. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Um, obviously, we know each other well. So um, just, just can you let the listeners know your current roles and just a little bit about yourself? Um, yeah, so, so currently, um, outside of football, I'm coming to the end of uh, a kind of three-year funded PhD um, where I've been re- researching kind of uh, formal coach education provisions within grassroots football. Uh, and that's been with the, the English Football Association uh, and Liverpool John Moore's University, um, and that's been that's been a, that's been a journey. Um, it's been good. Um, a little bit more to do in terms of the write ups, but um, yeah, it's been very productive. Um, I'm also a, an FA coach developer, so I tutor on the level one and level two, and have previously delivered on the UEFA B license. Um, and I'm also, uh, like you, mate, uh, an FA mentor for for Manchester as well so you know we, we look after coaches in the in the grassroots game um and to support and to guide them um and then i do a little bit of coaching as well in in, in the meantime with uh, manchester city and, and their selects program um so i take the the under nines group uh, along with another coach pat uh, and we, we have a great time in that as well so yeah fa- fairly busy fairly diverse set of roles <laughs> I was, well, as you can say, it sounds like you have quite the, the hectic schedule. And, um, and I know in the past we've spoke about managing that schedule. Just how do you manage to fit everything in? Yeah. Um, yeah, no sleep. <laughs> no sleep. Late nights. Late nights. Um, no, listen, it's tough. It, it, it is tough. Um, but I think, I think people in our industry can relate to that. You know, I think, you know, we, we were talking earlier around, you know, multiple roles and going to and from and, you know, evening work, weekend work. And, you know, I'm very fortunate, you know, like, like a lot of us are that, you know, and I think she'd kill me if I didn't acknowledge her to be fair that, you know, my partner Naomi is very understanding of, of kind of what, what I do um, and the requirements of that. So, you know, having that support network to be able to, you know, go out five evenings a week <laughs> and, uh, and, and to get your bits done is, is first and foremost really important. And, I think then you've got to repay that with, you know, sacrificing a little bit of your time to allow, you, you know, your partner to do the same. So, you know, sacrifice is, is key and, and having that support network is massive. Um, and yeah, you know, sacrifice, I think we're at the age now, or certainly I'm at the age now where, you know, I can sacrifice, you know, going out um, in order to, to, to stay in and, and do some work, whether it be, you know, supporting learners and projects or, you know, happily go out and do in situ visits and, and support or, you know, get out and, and, and coach on the grass and, and, and help some players. So I, I just think you've you got to compromise where you can, sacrifice where, where you need to, um, to to get to where you want to go, really, mate. I think it's, you know, getting <laughs> getting up early in the morning, doing bits you can. I, I'm a night owl, so, you know, I've always I've always tended to stay up late. Um, and I think, you know, like, like you, mate, we, we've got kids and once the kids go to bed and you know, Mrs. does her thing. I come in the office and, you know, sit and work, mate. That's, 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 that's what it is. You, you sit and you, you, you put the hours in when, when, as and when you can. So, yeah. <laughs> so obviously going from that, that pretty hectic schedule, we, we're talking now during what is, I'd say, what, week eight of the lockdown situation due to COVID-19. Um, yep. How has that changed for you then from living life in fast lane, several lanes? <laughs> where, you know, not being able to go out and support the coaches and yeah i mean listen uh, you know we we're, we're in a time where football is very much secondary you know whether we like it or not football is secondary to 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 humanity at this present moment in time i think we've got to you know recognize that we're in a a stage and a, and a time where you know consolidation sitting tight um, spending time with, with, with the family or, or what family you can at the, at the moment is, is most important. Um, and to be fair for me, you know, very fortunate that, you know, we, you know, we have a garden and, and, and the kids can, can play and can roam. And um, I think it's just taking stock of that. I think, you know, 
coaching wise, as you'll know, obviously the FA are, are trying their best to kind of, you know, support coaches where, where they can, you know, with a lot of CPD like, and obviously people have been stepping up like yourself, you know, putting these, these podcasts together, which is, which is fantastic, mate. And it, it's great for that. You're doing that, not, not just for, for your own development, but for, for the development of other coaches at this time. So, I think for me, it's just being able to actually spend some time doing some writing, doing some PhD. Um, my stuff at the moment is very much secondary to, to my partners as well. My partner works with kind of vulnerable adults who works for uh, a charity for you know uh, blind and deaf people, um, and that's a different world. You know, um, we're we're not privy to that world. You know, we're very privileged. So, um, yeah, just taking stock of that really, mate, and. Spending time with my kids, you know, like we, we have these hectic schedules. We don't often see them, or, you know, typical kind of weekly thing is, you know, you, you're you passing ships sometimes as they come in from school. You give them a kiss, you say how your day was, and then you're out and you're coaching. Whereas now, you know, you get to wake up and do some homeschooling. There's a lot of crying. Normally it's mine. Oh, Normally it's me crying. So you um, that from kids or you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's always, it's always from me, mate. Um so yeah, so it is difficult, but I think we've just got to take stock. You know, uh, you know, I'm I'm very fortunate to be in a very privileged position to have a house with a garden and and, and kids and, and the missus. So yeah, it's tough. Yeah, well, as I mentioned, very very hectic role, and um, even though it's busy, um, mm. I can imagine it's a very rewarding place that that you're in at the minute. Um, I just wanted to go sort of through your career to date and your sort of experiences along the way, mm. as those who are listening can tell you. Obviously, you work for Manchester FA, but yeah. the, it doesn't quite match. Where, where did you grow up and, and when did the love affair with football start? Yeah, so um, I'm from, from, I like to think of myself as an adopted Mancunian, if I'm honest. Um, I'm not sure how many people have that. But, you know, I've been up here nearly nearly eight years. Um, moved up to Manchester eight years ago. Uh, but I'm originally from, from East London. Grew, grew up in East London. Um, yeah, born, born and bred in, in, in Hackney and in Walthamstow. So... Um, you know, football is always part of it. You know, football football is part of it. I think um, my dad being being a, a Chelsea fan, uh, which he kind of in his days was the, the 70s and the 80s, and you know, Chelsea weren't the most prolific team back then um, as as they are now. And and I grew up, I guess, in the early 90s with football, where we still weren't that good. <laughs> um, but but my dad used to take me every week, and I guess it's very rare now in in the Premier League for teams like Chelsea and. You know, back in my day, we could stroll up to Stamford Bridge on the day and pay at the turnstile and, and get a seat. Um, you know, you can't do that now. So, so that, that's where it came from. My dad really kind of really passionate about his football. And we grew up as kids just always playing the game. You know, we, you know the type of life that, that we led was, you know, friends were family and you spent time with, with your friends like they were, like they were your brothers and your sisters. And we played in the park, we climbed trees, we, we played football. So yeah. that's where it stemmed from. And it went all the way through, all the way through school and, you know, all the way through, through college playing and, and, and university and stuff like that. So I've always, you know, you always love the game. You always love the game. Like I say, I think we, we said it a little bit earlier that we, we're struggling a little bit, but at the same time, we, we take stock of, of the current situation. So brought up in and around football, obviously a love affair started quite early. What age then did you get into coaching? As you mentioned, you played through your, your college days yeah I say I played I wasn't very good <laughs> <laughs> I, I, kicked, I kicked it and it went somewhere it wasn't always the, the, the intended you know destination but it went somewhere um no I actually got into coaching fairly late um actually because I think uh it was after I finished my my master's degree um at university and I came came home uh to London and I was teaching at the time so I was, I was currently going through teacher training and um yeah i just wanted to i'd been a bit battered and bruised so as well as playing football i played other sports i did a lot of running road running and my knees were starting to hurt and it's, it's baffling to say it you know 21 22 that you you're almost broken but i was and i just didn't want to put my, myself through it but i love the game so i said you know i wanted to get into, involved in coaching um and my dad put me in contact with you know a, a, a local club who, who had a very kind of uh, prestigious reputation, shall we say, um, and asked if I could maybe go along and, and, and do some bits. And, and I did, and it, it kind of stemmed from there, really. And I was extremely fortunate at the start of my, my coaching journey to have such amazing coaches. So 
um, you know, the main coach who, who I kind of worked with and liaised with and, and you know, even to this day, you know, we spoke last week, was an ex, ex-player, um, had coached for kind of 20 years uh, in the game and coached at, at, at kind of pro clubs, at youth level, so academies. And, and he just took me under his wing and, you know, his brother as well had massive ties with, with professional clubs in and around kind of London. And we just spent those kind of first two, two and a half years just going around showcasing the players that we had at pro clubs, the kids, you know, getting signed. And, and I was privy to that really early. So although it was classed as this grassroots side, we were almost like a showcase team where we just have these kids and, uh, I say kids, you know, ranging from, you know, 12 to 16, predominantly the ones that were being taken up by clubs. And we, I was so fortunate, you know, you know, I was around a licensed coaches from, from a very, very kind of early start in my career, but not a, as if they would shove it down your throat and, you know, not be licensed coaches that they shove it down your throat. They were just so humble about the game and they were humble about understanding who they were. And for me to understand who I was, and what my strengths were as a coach to to build upon. Um, so I guess not that kind of uniformed approach to to coaching. It's go and find what you're good at. I, I think I'm pretty good at this now, but don't copy me. Yeah. You know, can you shout as loud as me? Probably not. So don't shout. Find another way. Um, so it was interesting. I say that it's quite funny. I can shout. So, <laughs> Just, but but not compared to to, to Danny. So, um, so yeah. So that's kind of where it kick started really. And and they supported me through my initial badges. So I actually did my level one when I was at uni. But I think it was more out of the case that there was an opportunity. The uni were were supporting it. And you go, yeah, fine, I'll dive on it. But you know, I'm still kind of playing. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas when I returned to London, I done my level two, um, which was kind of the old version of the level two. Um, and then within kind of like four or five months, I was on my B license and mm-hmm. kind of that one, that was tough. And, but they supported me through it. You know, they, they said, look, come to training. How many players were you working with on, on course? Oh, X amount. Okay. What space did you have? Well, this much space. Right. Let's go. Let's go. Take them. What were you working on? This, this, and this. Okay. Show me what you did. So it was almost like getting, I guess the mentoring that kind of we do now, they were doing that far more informally just to, just to support my development, which, you know, I've always been very, very grateful of. I was, I was going to jump in with that. Um, just saying it, it's quite ironic really that as, as mentors ourselves, you, you were exposed mm. to that sort of level of mentoring mm. indirectly, really. How valuable would you say that, that that's been? Oh, in, invaluable, invaluable. And, you know, like I said, I, I spoke to Danny, you know, last week, um, cause we, we still talk regularly now and, you know, I've been up here eight years mm-hmm. and, you know, he, he's, he's one of my biggest role models, you know, as, as a coach and, and as a person as well, because, you know, for what he's done in the game uh, as an ex pro and, and what he's doing in terms of just continuously cycling, uh, cycling out good players that, that, that get into pro clubs. Um, it, it's amazing. And, to, to look back and, and understand that when he's having a conversation with you, he's in the moment with you mm-hmm. and he's not distracted and he's not doing it. And I try to take that, that those qualities that when I'm, when I'm you know, supporting coaches, whether it be on course or whether it be through mentoring, that I'm in the moment with them. And that's something that I really, really try and hone in on whenever I can, that I'm just there. And it's important to, to be present, you know, not to be, you know, distracted because we have, we've got so many distractions now with, you know, technology and social medias and, you know, phone calls and people messaging that sometimes we can be a bit busy doing that. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, I, ju- I just think that that really hit home for me um, to, to be that type of person, not, not just coach or coach developer or mentor, but be that type of person that's in the moment. Um, and I've carried that, I've carried that through. Can, can you remember your first ever session? Yeah, yeah, I can. It was a car crash. It was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but in all seriousness, in all seriousness, I, I, I'll admit that it was between, like, it was before I actually met uh, Danny and my, my dad's, one of my dad's friends again, a good local team. And I think I was like in my second year of uni and I think I was back for the summer and they were starting up pre-season and they said, oh, would you stick a session on? And I went, yeah, yeah, I'll do it. You know, big time. And I've got a level one. Um, I'll do it and uh, I, I use it now on course. I use it. I use the story every time on the level one course. And 
because I think I was still in the mode of playing and they were, they were under 12s. They were a grassroots team. Um, from what I remember, a lovely bunch of kids. And I just shouted at them. I spent like 46 out of the 50 minutes just screaming at them. And I was like getting so frustrated because they couldn't do what I was asking them to do. But I could do it. Yeah. So surely if I can do it, you should be doing it. You know, you're meant to be football players. What's going on? And, and yeah, it, it cringed and, and I got so frustrated. I remember walking off going, I'm not coaching. I'm never coaching. I'm going back to uni. I'm doing something else. You know, I'm going to become a sports psychologist. I'm not getting involved in the game because the players just couldn't do what I was asking them to do. And when I think back to the practice design and it was around possession and it was around switching play and I'm like, I, I couldn't do it now. <laughs> so, you know, what I was asking, I was work, work, asking them to work with multi-ball, you know, two or three balls going at one time. They were 12. And I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> so it stuck vividly in my mind, massively. Um, it, it's really intriguing, that, is that, you, as I say, you put that session on from your sort of mm. mind state and your ability and then yeah. try to put it onto the players. And look, what, what a learning experience that was. But I think there's a key message in there somewhere of understanding your players. Yeah. So yeah. a first session to put on a multi-ball practice, switching play, and what you're saying was was bold. But yeah, yeah. How, how important would you say it is about understanding your, your audience, really? Oh, listen, I mean, that, that was a session where, you know, I'd been on a level one course, which at the time was, was very different. I hadn't coached anyone before. Uh, and I just thought I was big time. And, you know, you reflect on it now and you have to say, look, before, before the game, you've got to get to know these, these little people. I say little people, you know, there's 12 year olds that are like six foot two nowadays, but, um, you know, you've got to get to know these people. You've got to know what makes them tick and, you know, you've got to know what they respond to, you know, some, some respond to, you know, direct instruction. Others don't, others respond to, listen, I'm going to ask you a question or I'm going to challenge you on X, Y, and Z. And I'm just going to watch and see what you do. And I'll ask you a little bit more after. Some need direction in practice. Some, they just need you well away from them. Mm. And you've got to take the time. So before all this detail comes out, before all these you know, magical practice designs you know, come free flowing out of you, you need to sit back and you need to kind of take stock of who these little people are um, and who these kind of you know, young kids are that are turning into kind of young boys and young girls who are then turning into young men and young women and what they're about because we often forget and we label them something that I've tried to get across you know recently and, and the stuff that I've tried to learn is that these aren't players these are just people they're people that play and the more you understand that every day these people develop in different ways and in different contexts whether the context be in football or in school or in the home or out with their friends it's going to impact on your session mm -hmm. um, and you've got to be aware of that you've got to take stock of maybe what's gone on that, that week, you know, whether it's been exam week for year 10s and year 11s or whether it's been a half term, we, you know, something we learned pretty, pretty quick at city that, you know, with, with our nines that the week after half term week, they always come back really sluggish. Mm. And I'm like, why? And they're like, Oh, we've been playing football like every day. So I'm knackered. <laughs> and you're like, right. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's fine. Like that. And you do, and you just pick them up and you just kind of play and, um, but you've got to know know about them, and that's really really important. Yeah, I, I, that's something I've learned, and and I love that that you've said there that they're not they're not players, the people mm. people that play. And do you know what? They're really really interesting and complex people, and it's great to get to know them and the little quirks and the characters. I mean, I, I've been fortunate this year to work on the twelves, and you know I've gone in with a mindset more of they are people and. Yep. The returns I've had in, in terms of the relationships and you know it's been it's been superb you know really enjoyed it this season um, look an array of academic qualifications including uh, a bachelor of science degree in sports science master's degree in psychology um, a PGCE and currently studying a PhD mm. um, would it be fair to say then that you enjoy the theory side of life uh, <laughs> um, yes Yes and no. Um, I think I think the caveat is is that I did when I did my degree and my masters. I was a lot younger, um, you know, traditional kind of college university. Loved the, loved the, the degree and, and wanting to stay at the university, and I really enjoyed the, the psychology. Um, 
so I stayed and, and did a, did a full time masters, and it was great. It was brilliant. Um, and obviously from that I became they became a teacher, so you know gained my PGC and taught, and that that was great. Um, and, and I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the practical element of teaching more than actually the theoretical side. Mm-hmm. Um, and really, uh, I think being in industry from you know for for a good kind of six seven years or eight years, sorry. And then deciding that it would be a really good idea to go back into academia was 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 probably not the best idea. <laughs> um, I can say that now because I'm at the kind of back end of it, I guess. But yeah, it was uh, it was it. Do you know what? It was a great opportunity, and it, and it has been a great opportunity. And doing doing a PhD has opened my eyes up to a lot of things that obviously I've been researching uh, around formal coach education. Um, you know the difficulties in, in creating it the difficulties in aligning it um you know the fa do 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 a really good job and have a lot of people who who are really well intentioned about you know the changes that have occurred in in formal coach education more recently it's not perfect um you know there's things that need to be you know developed and, and thought about which you know over time they will because you know in the fa they've got some fantastic people that work there so i've got no doubt that that you know it will continue to to develop and, and hopefully improve but yeah all, all these letters all these letters all these degrees i'll be honest and say that i did them because i wanted to do them and i found them interesting you know and i'm the type of character if i enjoy doing something i'll do it if i don't enjoy something i won't do it well, um you must enjoy a range of things because you know, currently sitting at 33 years old and all, and um, you've got that array of academic and sporting qualifications, as we mentioned. Um, obviously, a license, all it, two beautiful children. That's a lot you've packed into uh, life so far. Are, are you going to slow down at any point? Or? Yeah. <laughs> um, hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure when. Um, I can't slow down too much because otherwise, missus will kill me. Um, We've just had the new kitchen done, and she wants she wants the garden done now. So you know, it's why it's why I get all these jobs, uh, mate. You know, just <laughs> jump in, Martin. And you know, she she just keeps going. Oh, but we need a new garden, and so, yeah, all right, okay, I'll go out and do some more coaching. Uh, <laughs> I know that for you. Yeah, yeah. Listen, but there's a lot of us that do it. But um, no, listen, I, 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 you know, they're all great listening to them. To be fair, but I think again, I think it's indicative of people in our industry that we love what we do and because of the the complexity that now goes into football and and you know and coaching and you know teaching and learning and stuff like that you've got all these different avenues that people are exploring and like you say through 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 your podcast the people that you know you you've had on so far and the people that you're the, the, that you're liaising with they've got all these different specialities they've got all these different modes of of getting you know across their way of why they believe you know, it benefits their coaching and how it can benefit player development. And, and I'm just part of that system. And, and I've been very fortunate and really, really lucky that we've, you know, to go to a, you know, a, a good university that I've enjoyed. And, and certainly during my time on the PhD, you know, been, you know, been in contact with some phenomenal academics and, and fantastic kind of practitioners, both in university and at the FA. And, it's just I, I just take it more as a, a really fortunate journey that I've been on so far and had 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 the access to to speak to people and, and to critique people and, and you know have have debates and conversations really and just extend my own learning you know I'm not, I'm not perfect and I never will be so it's just just a, a privilege and a a pleasure to, to to be on you know just rolling as as we all are just getting through life I mean just, just trying. I'm, I'm always intrigued and engrossed when, when we chat, certainly at sort of the, the mentor meetings. And um, it, I really come away from our conversations with another way of thinking. Um, going back to sort of the roles in football, you've had full-time head of academy education at a football club, part-time academy coaching, coaching in Sydney. Is there anything you've not done? <laughs> no no uh, you know pro, pro level coaching would be nice but you know i think we know the standards of that and i'm very comfortable in saying that i'm just not there yet you know not nowhere near there's just the things i gotta learn there's exposures i need to be exposed to um opportunities and stuff like that but no again a lot of that's you know very very fortunate you know being being fortunate enough to to work full-time in football as, as a head of education and support the learning of, of scholars and you know, I guess the men, the informal mentoring side of of the lads as well, 
um, has been, you know, a real privilege. And, you know, I learned a lot in that time, certainly around the dynamics of, of how, a, you know, a particular club works. Obviously every club is different. Um, yeah. Part-time roles in, in different clubs, uh, you know, academy football, again, great, great learning opportunities. Um, I think it's really important that, you know, coaches going into academy football, wanting to go into academy football, you know, understand that, you, you know, you're going to be, you know, low down in the pecking order. You've got you to you gotta earn the right to, to be seen as a coach. And through that, it means you've got to develop the people that are in front of you, you know, both on and off the pitch, you know, both the, the qualities that are expected on the pitch and the qualities that are expected uh, off of it when they're, when they're representing, the, you know, the club that they're at. And I think, you know, I've come across some fantastic people who have shown that to me. And mm. again, in the game, had some real role models that, a humble and I think that's where I've been very fortunate that I've not really had any characters in my in my kind of world of football where they've just been a you know a bit up themselves or you know they've always tended to have a very kind of humble head on themselves and, and understood that you know they've they've not always you know succeeded that that failure is part of, of the learning process which I've tried to embrace um, certainly in the last three years with a PhD that's been part and parcel uh, academically but it, it stems from from the football um, yeah Sydney was was probably one of, the, one of the one of the best times in terms of my coaching it was one I think when you talk about you know when did you really know that coaching was for you it was probably my time in Sydney yeah 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 that was probably when I think you know I I, I passed my B license at the time obviously was working with, 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 with the club down in London um, and, and obviously decided to do a bit of traveling and was just very lucky to get a role at Sydney university, mm -hmm. you know, as, as the head coach of the reserve women's game, uh, never taught, taught, I taught female players. So in the club, there was, there was female players in, in the club, um, but never taken a female team. And to expose myself to that, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about communication and, and also being, you know, the assistant coach to the first team where, you know, in the first team we had kind of, I think it was between like four and six international players, you know, young, young Matildas. And, and, you know, these, these were, these were girls and ladies who could ping a ball far further than I can and with far more accuracy. So you had to really step up and you had to think about how you were going to go about planning. You know, you couldn't just turn up and, Put on a session they wouldn't they wouldn't be satisfied with that stuff so I think my love of planning which you know anyone that knows me knows that I love to plan I love I love a, a session plan I love it I love a bit of detail mm -hmm. um, and that's where it stemmed that's where it stemmed you know that that understanding that I had to come prepared because my on the field coaching was still kind of coming along it was still in a process where not that I wasn't confident but it's a different realm and yeah, Sydney was great for me. And, you know, the decision to, to come back was based on, right. I want, I want it now. I want, I want a bit of football now. I want to be involved. There's a couple, couple of things I've picked up on from there is mm -hmm. you said coaching in Australia was where you went. Yep. Yeah, this is where I want to be. Was there a particular moment or an action within a game, a session where you went, actually, I'm, I'm, a, I'm not bad at this and I could do more. Or was it just the experience as a whole? Um, I think having, it was the first time. So although in, in my coaching, I was working with players and stuff like that. I never worked with a team. So a team in terms of training and match days, it was never mine. I was always part of a coaching team, mm -hmm. which was great for me because I had to learn and stuff. But whereas when I went to Sydney, I was the head coach, mm -hmm. you know, so although I'd taken grassroots players, you know, girls, boys, males, females, you know, young men, young women, it was always in the context of a coaching team. Um, but when I went out, I, I was, I was the coach. I was the lead. Everyone was looking at me. And that's when you, I guess the development of your playing philosophy, which didn't really come into the, to the B license when we done it, it was very much on field stuff. So it's very different to what it is now. Um, so you had to really think about it and I had to develop a playing philosophy quickly. I had to develop, you know, a bit of a, a philosophy about what this team was going to be about. Um, and, I was very fortunate that we 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 done really well. You know, I I actually came across a, a reference last week that the director of football, who I you know just so happened you know ended up living with uh, him and his wife and stuff like that in their house because I was originally only meant to be there for like three months. And 
for the first nine weeks I was employed, I was living in a hostel. So, um, you know, trekking back and forth and stuff from the hostel to the training and stuff, it was always a, always a good laugh. But yeah, they, they put me up and obviously I stayed for the entire season and I was in, ended up being out there for just over a year. But it was just that whole thing of, okay, system, roles, responsibilities. Who do I need? You know, who are in the 16s that I can bring up? Who in the first team are going to be available for me to use as part of that? Um, so it was just all that process that I kind of put together or had to put together um, that made me really feel, yeah, do you know what? This is for me. Um, and, you know, we did, we did do well. We got, we got through to our first ever grand final. Um, we lost. I was devastated. We lost 86 minutes. They scored. We lost 1-0. Um, but, you know, overall, we were happy. We had the best defensive record in the league. Um, you know, we went, I think, a 17-game unbeaten streak. Um, and I didn't have any pre-season with them. You know, I, by the time I was actually doing some agricultural work up in the Tablelands, up in kind of um, northeast Australia, up in, yeah, up in Cairns. And by the time I flew down, I had two training sessions and we started our first league game. So, you know, the first six or seven games was really, the well, first six or seven weeks was me trying to really implement, you know, things quickly. And it didn't always go smoothly. You know, it wasn't, a, wow, what an amazing, you know, fairy tale this journey must have been. There was, you know, there was, there was arguments, there was crying, there was discussions, there was debates, you know, there was me dropping players that weren't happy. There was me starting players that didn't feel ready. Um, but all that, that kind of concoction just made me kind of really want it more. And that's, uh, you know, based on what I'd done and we knew that the first team coach was going to be, you know, uh, like retiring and, and I was offered the first team role, you know, after and a lot of the, a lot of the girls were keen for me to be in, but I, I made the decision that I wanted to come back um, because, you know, football, or, you know, soccer out there, which, you know, I can't stand the term bless them, but it is what it is, um, wasn't as prevalent as obviously it is here so you know decision to come back was was a conscious one based on career um so yeah Pick, picking up on that and, and a bit from the other conversation you, you mentioned failing and, and embracing now yep. look I, we've had come many conversations where i've picked up the phone and had a bit of a rant because mm. I've not had that interview or not had any any contact at all but you mentioned there obviously part of the phd and having those tough conversations with players, failing is actually part of winning, would you say? 100%. 100%. And I think it's, it's important to distinguish winning from success. So, um, you know, the age-old kind of uh, coach, uh, UCLA coach of John Wooden, you know, very prevalent, uh, asks you to kind of distinguish what success looks like to you in your context. So, you know, winning is is, is, the, is the outcome. That's the that's the result. That's you getting the three points or that's you getting to the next round or winning the trophy or whatever it may be. But, but success is very different. Success is what you're able to contextualize and what you're able to put down as a, as a marker, as a benchmark, you know, and although the, the, the success, you know, might not be winning the league, it might be that, you know, the development of the player's social skills is, is your overall, you know, I guess, outcome for success of a season. That's what you judge it on. And, and that's, you know, for me, the, the, the intention when I went to Sydney, for example, when, when I really had to think about it, was never to go and win the league. You know, I, I didn't know the league. I didn't know the teams. I didn't know the players. I didn't know the stand. I didn't know anything. And all I wanted really was to have a, a cohesive group that ultimately, from a playing perspective, just wouldn't concede goals. Mm. So we worked on defensive shape. We worked on organisation. And it transpired that we had the best defensive record in the league. Now, that's success for me that... that the, the kind of, I guess, um, the benefits or the subsequent things of that of getting through to a grand final just occurred because of that. Mm. Um, and, and, the, and the kind of relationships that I built within the squad. And, and again, not all of them. So we didn't get, I didn't get on with everybody and not everybody got on with me. Um, as my missus always reminds me, I am very much like Marmite. So it is, it is what it is in that sense. And I'm comfortable with that. And you've ha you, you have to become comfortable. So... I think it's just determining what success looks like and, you know, what success looks like for you in your context as a coach, what, what, what it looks like for the players, you know, do, depending on age groups and stuff, do, do the players kind of have a bit of an idea of what success looks like for them? You know, and if success is winning the league, okay, you know, how realistic is it? What, what is it that they think that we have to do as a collective or what do they have to do as individuals? So you're able to tease out 
kind of this this aspect of success and knowing that failure along the way is only going to support that process um and people have to be comfortable with that you know and, and it's difficult for, for certainly younger children to experience failure because nobody likes it you know to say we like failure we'd be lying we'd be lying but to to embrace it and to make it part of uh, you know a, a reflective process and a reflexive process to to build on and to further develop kind of what we do is essential you know we're not the, we're not the final end product and we never will be um so just, yeah just out of interest when when you went in as head mm. coach were you given targets that were aligned to the club's success or was it a case of you know go in do the best that you can see what comes from it yeah so so the director who you know is you know he's a close friend and i think from his family now we had we had a great relationship and he just said look this this is where they've kind of finished in the league in the kind of previous two or three seasons we feel that we've got quite a, a decent young crop of of girls coming through from the 16s um you know can you look to maybe integrate some of them and and go and push on and see where you know if you can get higher than before which you know we did we we, we tried to do and but i don't think it was ever you know John, John never put any pressure on me in terms of you must hit this target. You know, that's, that's not, that's not what it was. That's not what the relationship was. It was, you know, you, you'd wake up in the morning or you'd be having breakfast together and you'd be like, so, you know, game day, you know, I remember a game we drew nil nil and I decided to change the system. I, I went from a four, three, three to a, to a four, four, two diamond. And we didn't work on it in training. I just felt that for what we were doing, it just might have worked. Yeah, and I was trying to accommodate certain players and they didn't come off and we didn't, we didn't score a goal. We didn't concede, but we drew nil-nil. And he said, what was your thought process? I was like, yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> and we had to really dive into it. And that was, a, that was a point of failure where really it was a game that we probably should have won. Um, it was a game that we needed to win in order to kind of keep up with, with the pack. And we dropped two points and you kind of have to sit down and go, right, why did I do that? So instead of me reverting systems to accommodate i just had to say you know what i'm gonna to have to have a conversation with a player and ask is she comfortable playing either out wide um or she's going to be on the bench mm -hmm. and in the end that having the conversation was better for the team than than it was kind of trying to mold a system around around her mm -hmm. so yeah it was it was more that relationship where it was just kind of the probing and he was great you know he, he he's a very experienced coach you know in himself he's actually you know a scottish scottish fella kind of went over from australia and he, he knows the game and he just teased that stuff out a little bit which again just just got me reflecting and got me thinking really i, I really like the honesty there of um i don't know if it was a backhanded sort of insult or whatever it may have been of mm. during a game nil nil of what were you thinking? And you, you were quite honest and said, don't really know. Um, can, can we be guilty as, as coaches of, of maybe doing things on impulse because it's seen as, you know, savvy to, to make impulsive decisions without thinking? Yeah, uh, listen, uh, you, you've always got to adapt to, to different elements of the game in different moments, whether it be, you know, in a training session before game or, or you know, in the lead up, depending on obviously how many times you train or it might be on game day that a player calls up sick and, you know, they might be a deep line four in a three and you're like, right, okay, I don't really have someone who I feel can suit it. You know, we're, we're going to have to play two two players down. We're going to have to play with two, you know, two sixes realistically or whatever, or two eights or whatever you want to call it. So you adapt that as and when you was. I just think that, and, and listen, I think honesty is a really important thing in coaching anyway. So, and the, the, you know, the point that you made, you have to, you have to be honest with yourself. You you can you know give it all the spiel to everybody else, but you've got to be able to look yourself in the mirror. You've got to be able to look yourself, you know, on webcam, record yourself, kind of reflecting if you need to, or writing stuff down. And you need to be okay with saying, you know what, that was my fault. You know, and by the way, I wasn't at the beginning. I used to try and blame everybody else. Everybody, it weren't my fault. It was the players' fault. They can't do it. I've told them to do. They can't do it. But over time, you realise what a big impact you have as a coach. Uh, either positively or negatively. And, you know, I think we just need to try our best to do that. And I think the key point in that scenario is I just wasn't thinking. I just wasn't being reflective. And I just went on, I guess, inexperience and naivety to say, ah, I've played football manager. I've changed systems. It will work. Do you know what I mean? And um, and that's, that's the brutal honesty. I think in terms of me looking back on it, that's probably what it was. It was just naivety and a lack of an ability to, to sit back and really reflect and say, actually, do you know what? I probably just need to have a conversation with a player. 
Um, this is this is slightly going off track, but yeah, I'm just referring to it to an incident I I was involved in on a on a level one course about twelve months ago. Was that? Do you think with the access to um, high level information, yeah. a, a yeah. range of coaches, and I'm not I'm not trying to go away with this in terms of a level one coach because we've all been level one coaches and really keen and you know excited to get on the grass and help others, but you know, I was speaking with an under sevens coach, um, talking about high pressing yeah. and, you know, gang, gang, gang pressing. And, and I was like, do you understand it? H how are you going to pass that message to your sevens? Mm -hmm. So do you think for all the good access that we've got, can you, do you think it can be negative at times if you don't understand it yourself and then therefore fit it to your players? Yeah. So <laughs> I put a, a tweet out a couple of weeks ago, I think, um, you know, obviously we're in the midst of, of, of a lockdown and, you know, all these kind of online kind of webinars and, and support networks and podcasts and stuff. And they're great. And listen, they are great because what they're providing is information. Mm -hmm. But what we often get confused with is that we assume that information equals to knowledge and it just doesn't. Mm -hmm. And what we have to do is we have to go through a filtering system in our head of deciding what it is that's relevant for us in this moment. And what's relevant, more importantly, for our players that we can use to help them get better. Now, listen, the people that put on, you know, all these analysis and stuff, it's phenomenal. It's brilliant. Mm -hmm. But if you're getting grassroots coaches and, you know, listen, you know, I, you know, I still look at and watch and go and watch grassroots coaches, certainly from a mentoring perspective and watch what they try and do. And there's some wonderful stuff that goes on, some brilliant stuff. So it is opening coaches' eyes to being aware of certain things. But in certain contexts, it's just not relevant. They just don't need X, Y, and Z, you know, at that time. They, they need something that's tangible for that level of player. Not necessarily for the coach, because, you know, I understand what you're saying. A level one coach doesn't make a level one person. Mm. You know what I mean? I, I've seen and worked with some phenomenal level one coaches. Phenomenal. People who I would happily work alongside because of the, the other skills that they have. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and we, we, we take more and more kind of, or we're more and more aware, sorry, now that people coming on these courses, some of these are, are architects, they're lawyers, they're teachers, they're engineers. Some of these people have other qualities that they're working 50, 60 hour weeks and they're able to organize themselves and families. These are qualities that, that just tie in wonderfully to coaching that hopefully now we make people more aware of. And it's not just purely about the game. And really the game stuff, yes, it will come from information, but it will come from learning, doing it yourself. It will come from, you know, sitting with other people. It will come with standing next to other people and coaching. So I just think that information for me is never a bad thing. It's just that, are you aware that you have a, that you need to go through a filtering system of what you deem to be relevant at a particular time? Mm -hmm. And it's not to say that you can't revisit something in six months time or a year's time and go, do you know what? As my, you know, my age groups have gone up, so we've changed formats from nines to, to 11s or we've changed from sevens to nines. And you know what? I think I could probably put a bit of a new spin on it. Mm. And I remember reading this article or I remember watching this webinar and you know what? I might try and begin to apply it. Mm. Um, but for me, knowledge is only knowledge once you're able to apply it. And that's, you know, we work in a realm where our application is on the field. Yeah. You know, so all the thought processes all the, all the all the cognitions that go on in our head can be fantastic but if we're unable to to kind of translate that into meaningful application for our players it's just wasted information for me in my opinion i could be i could be wrong but that's how i see it and that's the difficulty at the moment that because we are exposed to so much that we often forget to just maybe take stock a little bit recognize where we are where we maybe want to be or where we may need to be at times sort of going on from that and, and again this is just my opinion per se is that having done the level one and level two through the old sort of course layout and yep. now seeing the coaches coming through or, or the people coming through on level one to become coaches mm. it's not no again my opinion it's no longer the the old school typical lads and dads you're now getting people who are coming through and being coaches, not just a parent. Mm -hmm. And I think the way that the courses have been structured has, has really helped ignite curiosity and people, you know, you've probably seen it more as a tutor, but I'm seeing mums 
dads who just want to keep the team to, for their, their children coming on with so much enthusiasm to, to make not only their child, but other people's children better. Mm-hmm. That can only be a positive thing for, for the game, can it not? Hundred percent, and that's that's one of the you know the, the big pluses of these kind of new new courses that have come out. That exactly that it, it's ignited a, a, an element of curiosity, and that curiosity is fueling enthusiasm to to go and learn a little bit more and go and learn outside the sphere of of you know formal coach education. And I think what's really important to understand is that formal coach education is just a really really small part of any coach's overall development. You know, we, 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 and listen, I do get it to a degree. And I was certainly the same when I first started that we see formal coach education because we get the certificate and we can call ourselves level one coaches, two coaches, B license, A license, pro license, whatever, wherever your, the level is. And we, and it carries a level of esteem, certainly with the English FA because of, you know, of, I guess how we're viewed across the world. Um, and that's, that's great. But the thing that I keep, you know, saying is that is that a certificate will, will get you an interview for a role, mm-hmm. you know, whether that be with voluntary coaching at a, at a charter standard grassroots club, or whether it's an academy, or whether it's for a full time, you know, first team manager's position. But the quality of your coaching will keep you there. Mm-hmm. And what what the formal coach education system allows for is that accreditation, and I guess that trusting that you've hit that level at that particular time now what coaches have to be aware of is that we're, we're more than capable of just rolling back into our old selves. You know, we've all done it. We've all gone, you know what? Oh, tonight I'm tired. I've done, you know what? I'm just going to put a safe session on. I know how to do it. I know what the details top of my head. I'm just going to roll it out. And often sometimes coaches can get into a habit of just continuously doing that. And that's not coach development. Mm -hmm. So although you may have a level two or you have a B license or whatever level you have, because you've shown that you can do it, it doesn't mean that you're going to do it consistently. And I think what these courses are doing are providing that constant ignition to go and want to do something new or, or go and look at another you know, area of coaching. And obviously, it's certainly more prevalent in the last kind of five, 10 years has been more of the, the psychological and social elements of, of, of player development. Um, I'd like to think that we're not getting overawed by it and we're not forgetting about the game because the game is important you know, and that brings physical demands as well as technical and tactical demands um, on top of the psych and social. But again, it's, it's all relative to context. And I think that's the most important thing that when we're working with coaches and when we're working with players, we we have to understand who they are. We have to understand their environment. We have to understand the context and what they believe success looks like. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's where it comes in. And and listen, these courses have done that. The the, the courses have done that. They've ignited that, that curiosity. to go away and learn new things, which, as you said, is only a positive. Bit of a, a, a tough question, really. Oh, oh no. um, and, and I must state that it is our opinions only, not those of our employers. Um, yeah. England DNA, yeah. how much of an impact has it had? In the grassroots game? Yes. Loads. It's had a massive impact. Um, you know, you've only got to look at the work of, of Pete Sturgis with, you know, Foundation DNA and, and more recently Graham Carrick with the Youth Development DNA um, that's kind of being rolled out and, and roadshowed and stuff like that. And listen, for it's great for, for me in, in, a, in a certain context. And, and what again, what it's providing is new forms of information that's relevant to our context, mm-hmm. right? And again, what we can't get too giddy about is remember it's information, You've got to go away. You've got to filter it. You've then got to see how it applies to your context. And that's where you've got to go through this process of planning a bit, go and delivering, go away and reflect on it. What worked, what didn't work? Because, you know, some of the practices that Pete puts on are fantastic, but they might not work for your group of players. They might just be a completely different set of personalities. And the way in which someone like Pete Sturgis works, his personality is able to get X, Y, and Z out of the players. Whereas, your personality might be very different. So the, the, you know, the England DNA provides a, an overview and some, some pointers of, of how you could coach. It's not the only way. Mm. It's just a way. And I think we have to be very kind of conscious of that, that it's neither good nor bad. I think the only time where it can be dangerous is that people start talking about it as if it's the only way. Mm. Um, and that's, that's the 
you know, and whether that be coming from tutors, whether that come from mentors or whether that come from coaches, oh, I do it this way because the FA say, and you're like, okay, I understand that, but have you been exposed to other ways? Have you tried other ways? You know, don't please don't get bogged down that because a, a national governing body says it's true or, or it's good that it must be good. It's yeah. what's relevant to you. And again, you know, we, we both work for the FA and you know, I've had plenty of conversations around the England DNA. Some of the coaching fundamental stuff that we that obviously we've been exposed to simply for in my opinion don't apply to the to the context of the grassroots game. Some of them absolutely do. The thing for me on the DNA is is again it invokes that sort of curiosity within coaches of who are you? How do yep. you play? How do you coach? And and for me, that that asks a question for a coach to think about those strands. For me, yeah, hundred percent. And listen, you know those five those five pillars around kind of who you are, how you play, um, how you coach, how you support. You know the future player. It's all within context. And if it generates thought process, great. Um, but as I said earlier, we we just need to be conscious that the thought processes are great how do you go and apply it? You know, how do you go and put measures in? How do you go and practice? You know, how do you go and put into practice what it is that you're thinking about? Because there's a very, there's a massive difference between thinking about a plan and actually executing it. Yeah. Um, and I'm massively privy to that. You know, I think of some of the most wonderful sessions in my head, but then when I get it down on paper and do it in practice, it's terrible. <laughs> do you know what I mean? You look and you go, ah, oh, maybe it worked in my head. You need to be doing it. How I thought about it in my head, what, what, you know, what's wrong with you? Um, but then you've got to go in, you've got to reflect, you know, and, and that's where we just need to be not, not careful. We just need to be aware. Mm. Just need to be aware of the, 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 the amount of information, the exposure to England DNA. And listen, we, we, we talk about it because obviously we're, we're, we're employed with it, but there's other ways. There's other ways, you know, this, the DNA is a way and it's a really good solid way to introduce coaches to the different things to think about but there's other stuff out there and you've just got to be, you know, take the time to really not go at hundred miles an hour, not think that your coaching practice is going to develop massively in three months. You know, it's, it's baby stepping fundamentals that are going to allow you to, to make long-term changes into coaching practice because long-term development from coaches perspective is only likely to result in long-term player development and long-term person development. I think just, I could talk all day, with you know and and i think based on the dna that's going to be another chat that we have at a different time i think we're, we're gonna we're gonna have to have that recorded when we when we discuss that but one thing i wanted to sneak in uh, obviously mm. you've had a busy career to date you've also um published a book called youth soccer development um progressive yeah. player to improve the person when did that come about how did you fit it in and yeah. <laughs> the inspiration behind it yeah well it was fortunately it was it was before the kid it was before the kids turned up so i had a little bit of time so it was all right you know and you had the, the, the three jobs at the time and the missus no kids so loads of time um no the the book came out of it was during my time uh when i was head of academy education and also i've been a teacher for a number of years at that point i was coaching as well and i was just kind of going through day after day you know teaching and, and trying to support support the lads you know in their life their wider life as much as, as on the field because you know within my full-time role that but that wasn't my responsibility um and and it just got me thinking really around you know what if these players don't get in and and listen we know the stats about you know those that make it and those that don't and stuff like that so that doesn't need to be kind of regurgitated but my head and, and i guess my my coaching kind of premise and, and what i believe to be true uh, for me is that, you know, good people make good players, mm. you know, good, good, good. And I'm not saying that you have to be perfect. You don't have to be angels, but you do have to have something about you as a human being. If you want to make it in the game, you know, whether that be, you know, different levels of, of motivation and, or desire and stuff. And I guess, you know, very prevalent that, you know, I guess that we've all watched is the last dance with, with Michael Jordan. And I guess that that's a testament to, to the motivation and the desire and the belief and and that doesn't stem from him as a basketball player that stems from him as a human being so i mean i wrote this you know five years ago well no six years ago i wrote it and it got published you know back in 2015 i think um and i guess i i, I the honest answer is i wrote it just to see if i could i had ideas in my head that i wanted to get on paper and when i kind of ended up putting it on paper i ended up dividing it into some chapters that i thought might might work um, 
and I just sent it to a publisher one day and they said, look, it's a great idea. Let's build some chapters. Um, let's build some more chapters. Let's make it kind of accessible to these readers. And, you know, extremely fortunate to, to, to have it published and, and, you know, for it to be on, you know, Amazon or whatever it's on and stuff. And then it's brilliant. But, you know, there was no incentive to go out and say, oh, I'm going to write a book and it's going to be a bestseller. And that, that was never the intention. It was, I think when we talk about developing coaching philosophies and we talk about, you know, understanding who we are, I think that book is at the time who I was. Um, and don't get me wrong, there's some chapters in there that I probably wouldn't write again. Um, there's some chapters in there that are just probably just whinging and it's a, they're naive chapters. Certainly the, at the beginning, I think I spoke, you know, a lot about the FA before I worked for them and it was, it was a naive chapter to write. Um, but other stuff later in the book around certainly developing people. And I use the example of, um, something that I tried when I was during my time at Sydney and, and, and I try to do in different formats now. So it was just a wonderful experience to write it, but it was never written to, you know, be a, be a, be a Dan brand, Dan, Dan Brown style, <laughs> style book. Uh, do you know what I mean? It was just, could I do it? Let's give it a whirl. Let's see if people want to read it. And, you know, fortunately some, some people have read it and, you know, some people contacted me and, we spoke about it. Some people from, from professional clubs, you know, phoned me up and, and, and we had conversations about, about it. And, and I guess it, it came at a time where, uh, you know, although this was prevalent around developing people, you know, it probably came at the right time, you know, five, six years ago where it started really kind of kicking in about this, this holistic development. Although, you know, previous clubs would have done it for years and years and years and, and industry and certainly in academia, it's been something that's been spoken about for decades. So, yeah, it was just my, my, I guess, a reflective or an experiential piece, really. Any scope for more to be published, or is that fair? <laughs> <point? laughs> um, at the moment, so within the PhD, um, there's a couple of papers that I'm writing for, for, from an academic perspective, so with an academic audience in mind um, in, in terms of the research. So that's certainly taking precedence at the, at the moment. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe in time. I'm, I'm conscious, though, that, like I said, I never wanted to write a book for the sake of writing it. I wanted to see if I, if I could write it. I wanted to get my thoughts down that I thought were important to me at the time and, and maybe important to other people. I'm conscious at the moment that, that there's a lot of books out there, a lot of people in similar positions to, to myself and, and, and obviously, you know, you as well is we've all got something to say, you know, and, and a lot of people are, are thinking and feeling that, you know, look, let me write a book about it and stuff. And, and that's fine. And that's, you know, I would encourage anyone to give it a go, you know, right. Writing is, is, is a, is a great skill to have. I'm not very good at it academically, by the way, but you know, in terms of writing, you know, the book and stuff, it was a great learning process. So certainly encourage it, but yeah, I'm just a bit conscious of if there was something meaningful that I thought, you know what I could build upon? Yeah, definitely. But I, I, it's not something that I would force at the moment. Going back to the, the coaching then, is there a yeah. level that you enjoy more than others? I, the academy work you've done, female game, grassroots, semi-pro? Uh, honestly, do you know what? I love it all. I love it all. Football's football for me, you know, and my biggest thing is I love the game, but I love developing people. Mm -hmm. And wherever that setting is, I'll go, I'll go to it. So, you know, making a conscious decision when, when you know, asked to, to come in and, and maybe do a little bit of City with the Selects programme. So obviously it sits under the academy. It's not the academy. It's effectively their, their kind of understudy. It's their kind of core development centre. And when they asked kind of what age group, you know, I, I asked if I could have a young, young age group, you know, you know, could I, because for the previous six or seven years, I'd been older age groups. I'd been kind of 15s, 16s, 18s, 21s. And I wanted to go back to, to I guess, where I started, you know, and, and working with these kids. Um, and just seeing the life in them, seeing this love and passion for the game again. Um, whereas I felt for certainly the back end that coaching got a bit serious and I get that it is to a certain level and a certain degree, but those, those nines have, have it kind of almost showed me the, the love of the game again, which has been, which has been lovely. And to be fair, I get that. I get a similar sense when I go out and I, and I observe coaching sessions in grassroots football, you know, even as a mentor or when I'm, you know, doing in situ visits and stuff like that, I, I just feel it. I, I get a real kind of emotive kind of, I guess some flow going through me where I go, you know, what? I love this. And I don't care if it's on a mud patch and I don't care if it's on concrete and I don't care if the kids can't kick a football to save their lives. It's just being in it. So 
I guess I'm lucky in that sense. I just, I just love everything about it. Well, that's, that's brilliant. I mean, what, one of the sort of final questions before we go on to our, I'm, I'm not going to say famous, I'll, I'll say quick fire question round, but um, yeah. your experience as a teacher and coach developer, does that yeah. influence the way that you coach now? Are you, are you very conscious of how you coach? Um, yes, in, in the most part. Don't get me wrong, I still get caught up in the moment. I still get caught up in it now. You know, if something great happens, I'm cheering like a fan. If something goes wrong in a particular moment, uh, you know, I'll go off. I'll be like, what's going on here? <laughs> what's going on? Why, what, why did that happen? <laughs> yeah. So I still get it. But yeah, I'd like to think that, you know, my coaching process over the years has, has developed and that stemmed from, you know, an understanding maybe of pedagogy and, and, and you know, more recently within, I guess, kind of tutoring with, you know, 16 plus so adult learners, Andrew Goji and, uh, I, again, it's not something that I'm perfect at, but I do. I, I, I'm, I'm very, uh, I very much value the process of coaching. Now, um, I'm really trying to take my time with stuff. So, so yeah, I think across the kind of disciplines of of, of teaching, of of coaching, and, and of learning myself, of being a learner. You know, I've spent the last three years. Well, I'm always learning, but certainly in the last three years, really being probably you know the novice learner in a field of academic research that just you know most of it flies over my head yeah. so to sit there and feel the feelings that i feel i try and take that in what players might try and be feeling maybe what learners are feeling on courses what coaches might be feeling when, when i first meet them so you know i try my best to to kind of you know build the relationships and build trust and, and build that little bit of you know fun amongst us and fun amongst the players uh at the same time as, as trying to get that you know the most development out of them so yeah, it's it's tied in over the years. It's been it's been it's been a number of years now. So the future then you're coming to the end of your PhD. Yeah. Obviously a little bit more time to to get on with that PhD at the minute. Um in between obviously homeschooling. What does yeah. the future hold for you then or what is there any aspirations or just see what No, nah, do you know what I, I said I said I said this to a few people that I'm a bit like a magpie with at the moment that and I've always been like that. If I enjoy something, I'll go after it. And if there's opportunity within that sphere to do something, I'll go and do it. And if I love it, I'll be in it for 10 years. If I don't, if I don't love it and it's not something that I see or if it's not something that I feel that I can give my all to, um, you know, I do my best to kind of step aside. And, and you, know, opportunity, you know, opportunities are quite you know, rare in football. And if I don't believe that I'm not either the right person for the job or if I don't believe that I can give my all, then somebody else is more deserving of those, of those roles and of those things. So for me at the moment, it's, it's very much consolidation, you know, that, you know, we're both, I guess, fortunate and unfortunate in this time. But, you know, I, I have, you know, a couple of roles at the FA, you know, part time and, and, you know, I have a role at City and, you know, what, what it looks like from a, an academic perspective. Who knows? Who knows? You know, I, I'd love to go in and do some some teaching in, in he and you know pit myself up against the students and, and other kind of academics and, and other kind of practitioners and, and go from there but um i'll be honest i don't really stress too much about it i just kind of like a bit of a dog with a, with a bone really once i've got it i get all giddy and i don't really think about what happens after um so yeah that's my honest answer mate i don't know <laughs> Fair enough, mate, but i'm pretty sure that you know from those who've listened to the chat which i know you well enough you'll be a success in whatever you do. Mm. Last, last sort of in-depth question that I, I'm going to ask before we go to our not very quick fire round. Um, yeah. If you could go back and speak to a young Noel Dempsey, mm. or any young coaches listening to this, what advice would you give? For looking to forge a career in the football world, what, what would you... What yeah, would you so, so the first one would certainly be know the difference between badge collecting and learning. Um, you know, I was, I was, I was that, I was that person, hundred percent. You know, oh, I'll get my two. Oh, I need to get my B because you know, if I get my B, oh, I'm going really to work in Premier League in six months. I'm going to be smashing it. You know, you have that naivety to it, and I think the 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 more you can be aware early on that learning takes place far more away from these accreditation courses, and to go and embed yourself in an environment that you feel that you can really learn from and and offer as well. You know, the biggest thing that I, you know, got taught, I guess, more from a, a personal background was if you if you're all, if you're wanting something, make sure that you're able to offer something as well. So, you know, even if it's the case of look, 
can you offer me some knowledge and some insight and some support? And what I'll offer you is me picking up the cones, me grabbing the footballs that got kicked in the hedge. Um, you know, I'll do, I'll do the warm up if you want and just kind of building it from there. And I think that it kind of ties that in really to, to go in and being prepared to go and get on the grass, you know, or, or the, the Astro, you know, go, go and get on it, go and go and put on a session. Don't, don't be afraid to fail on it. Um, you know, as long as you've got the best intentions for, for, for the kids or, or the players that you're working with at heart, you're always going to be okay. You know, it, it's only when you really, and we see these coaches, you know, when there's, when their own self-interest outweighs the interest of the players, that's a problem. Mm. And, and I get that everybody in coaching wants to be at the top level. And I get that, well, most, um, you know, not all, but, you know, and, and the player and the coaches want to develop and they want to progress and they want to be at this club or this club, you know, just please don't do it at, at, at the expense of, of the people that are in front of you yeah. um, or the people that are around you, you know, because bridges are, are, are very easily burnt in, in the game. And, and I, I'll be honest as well. I, you know, there's a few bridges that I've burnt along the way and, and I massively regret those. Um, and, you know, sometimes you've got to, you know, either phone up or if you see them, you've got to apologize. You've got to put your hand out and say, listen, I apologize for that. Um, Cause I've done it hundred percent. So I think just, just being aware that, you know, yes, go and do the courses. They're, they're, they're great, but you know, go and learn, go and go and learn the game, go and learn what it's like to be on the grass in different contexts. You know, the stuff that I do now as a player, you know, I, t I took from what I did within the women's game. And, you know, although that, that time in it was, you know, just, just over a year, really, it was phenomenal. And the stuff that, that I learned, you know, I apply to kids football, to, to young players football, to adults football, uh, and it's just adapting. So, yeah, that's that. That's probably the key one. And I think during that time, you just um, you develop an understanding of who you are. And I think understanding a, a, who you are as a person is probably the most important aspect. You know, knowing what you're about as a human being, because and I guess we talk about it as a coaching philosophy. You know, understanding your beliefs, understanding your values. Well, what are your values and what are your beliefs as a human being? You know, what do you what do you honestly practice and preach every day? And if you do those stuff, you'll naturally take them into your coaching. If you try and, you know, put forth some really superficial and generic beliefs and values that you try and, I guess, act out, yeah. people will see right through you. Yeah. Um, and I think it's better to be yourself and be the best version of yourself rather than kind of tell a lie to people or tell a lie to yourself, yeah. you know, even, even worse, tell a lie to yourself and, you know, not be you. So, yeah, I think that will kind of be my, my advice, long-winded as it may be. <laughs> no, it, it, it really hits a tone because towards the end, of the, the answer there is um, there was a gent who was on our Talent ID Level 2 um, who I yes. stayed in touch with, had a chat with him, it just became really informal. And, and he asked me a question um, and it made me feel really, really uncomfortable because it's okay. the first time I've ever been asked it was what are my key beliefs that I bring to every session? And do you know what? I couldn't answer it. Mm. And, and it's taken a lot of thinking to understand what they are. Yep. And what, honestly, do I bring to every training session? Because I don't bring the love to the game. As we mentioned, you know, before this, this chat, I don't bring the love to the game to every session because, you know, other work sometimes dictates that, you know, experiences at home, what, whatever it might be. As you mentioned, you just right, get a session on that's, that's facilitated, but that's not fair. And, you know, it's not fair to the players. So what, what do I bring to every session? And it, and it made me feel uncomfortable. And it, I'd, I'd say for the first time in a long time, I was, I was in a situation where I thought, wow, oh, I, don't, I don't know who I am yep. in terms of that. And it, it was great. And, you know, anybody out there who's listening, I challenge you to, to get that down on paper. Who, who are you and what do you bring to every session? Yep. So, look, quick fire question round. Um, uh -oh. I don't think it's going to be quick fire, but we'll, we'll have a go. Um, Best experience in football to date? Um, oh, they're all great experiences. Uh, pro, 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 probably as a, as, a, as, a, as a bubble of time, probably the Sydney stuff, because it just kick-started everything that I wanted to kind of be and everything that I wanted to do. Okay. Best friend in football? Best friend in football? Oof. Um, Probably in Manchester, probably, you know, the people that I liaise with the most and, and who have turned into some really great friends. Uh, first would be probably Jay Brownell, who's the under-23s manager at Cheadle. 
um, where I kind of you know supported supported the club a little bit and you know originally met him at, at, during our time at Radcliffe when he took the under 21s and um, he, he's a great person you know great human being um, good manager um, so certainly him and probably you know Will Griffiths who who actually started off through the mentoring program as a coach that I went and, and kind of watched and observed and after a while it was kind of you know what I'm not mentoring you anymore we're just we're just mates really aren't we and we we speak at least three four times a week every week and he just challenges me on certain questions or I challenge him and and it's turned into a really great friendship where you know I, I trust him and he's a good coach and he was on a, you know the first B license that I delivered as well and you know he's, he's a really really good person as well so probably those two Excellent. yeah <laughs> toughest opponent that can be either as a player or a coach uh, well, as a player, I didn't really come across many because I wasn't very good. But um, uh, I think coaching, I think during my time when I was, you know, coaching at, at Burnley, um, you know, we played, you know, the likes of Liverpool and, and, and Man United. And they were always like our cup finals. <laughs> you know, they, they were our cup finals. We'd go there and we'd shut down shop and they said, we're going to nick it here. We're going to nick one. And uh, yeah, it, probably probably those two, I have to say as well, that one of them, we actually beat Liverpool. Um and that was that was like one of my proudest moments as part of a coaching team. You're like get in, you know. Um, so yeah, probably those as as a coach. Brilliant. Best player you've coached? Oh. Um, in terms of ability, can, it can be ability. Oh. I'd say all round package. Right. Um. Okay, so probably uh, um, there's probably a couple to be fair. So, so Danny Adzed, who who I had as a youngster at Rochdale, who's you know obviously played played for Rochdale's first team, now signed at Norwich. He was phenomenal, you know, at twelve. He was different class. Um, I'll be honest, I don't even think I had to coach Danny. <laughs> I just think I had to tell him don't kill anyone on the pitch. Um, he was he, he was that good. Um, I guess older age groups during my time at Burnley, you know, very privileged to spend time and, and support and coach kind of Dwight McNeil a little bit. But again, was a phenomenal player anyway. Um, he just needed a kick up the backside every now and then in terms of tracking back. But, you know, he certainly added that, he added that to his game now, you know, fair play to him. And he, he was brilliant. And I guess in the same cohort as that, probably Callum, Callum Styles, who's, I believe, currently at Barnsley. Um, technically, probably one of the best players I've seen. He's phenomenal, phenomenal, and 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 a lovely kid. To be fair, all three of them were, all three of them were great, great kind of young men, um, and very privileged to to kind of play a, a tiny, tiny snippet in in their journey. Good. Um, biggest role model or influence in football? There's not one. There's not one. <laughs> um, there's multiple. I think from a, from a London standpoint. You know, I don't go beyond uh, Danny Bailey and, and Trevor Bailey, um, and even even their other brother Gary Bailey. You know, just from a, a supporting network point of view, in in terms of understanding the game early on as as a coach and and understanding kind of my own beliefs and values as a person, they they were instrumental. Um, since being in Manchester over the last eight years, uh, you know, Jack Trainer has been a massive influence on me. Uh, first met him at, at Bolton Wanderers when I came in and. You know, we, we've been kind of good friends and colleagues since. Um, and he's a very humble man. You know, so much experience as a coach developer um, and as a coach as well, both within the pro game and, and obviously now within kind of formal coach education. So certainly him. Um, similar vein in, in probably Mark Edwards, uh, who again, I met at Bolton and, and he, was, he actually took me to Burnley as a coach and, he he had a big influence on me and a different personality, but you know loved the game, cared for you, wanted the best for you. Um, so from him, and then probably in the same kind of breath, uh, Keith Mayer, who who at the moment is 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 kind of doing the rounds. You know, he's recently published a book with his son David, and, and both of them are, are wonderful human beings, phenomenal coaches and coach developers, and kind of thinkers of of the game and of and of kind of development as a person as well. So. You know, me and Keith share or have shared many a kind of morning breakfasts together and teas and conversations and you know sitting and speaking to Keith is 
it's like going into a vortex and you come out of the vortex and you're like, well, where have I been? <laughs> where have I been? What, what happened? What did he say? And you, it takes you like four days to kind of think about it. But he's certainly one who, you know, has taken the time to, to get to know me and, and has offered some great insight. So again, I'm, I'm extremely fortunate. I'm so fortunate with the people that are around me to, to influence and stuff like that. And and listen on the flip side, you know, all the coach developers, you know, that I you know, liaise with and, mentors who I liaise with like yourself we, we, you know I'm very fortunate to have that network of people that you know we can call upon so yeah describe yourself in three words oh fuck um three words what are you getting um honest uh passionate marmite <laughs> like it <laughs> <laughs> Final question from me tonight, no, because we, and, and I'm sure we could chat for, for days, but um, is, is there anyone you would recommend or like to hear on the podcast? Oh, any of the names above, um, you know, that I said, you know, Jack Trainer, phenomenal man, you know, phenomenal experience, both as, a, as an ex-professional player, playing abroad, um, you know, full-time, you know, working in football in, in an academy setting and, and, and stuff like that. So Jack would be great currently, uh, but he's at UCFB as a coach developer, so at the university, uh, at the Etihad campus. Um, Mark Edwards, who's a uh, kind of specialist coach at Burnley now. Um, phenomenal experience. Uh, as well as Keith, and, and, you know, Keith at the moment, I know he's doing, you know, created his own podcast thing, but Keith is very, very, you know, wonderful with his time, very kind of accommodating and, you know, his knowledge base is phenomenal. So, you know, any of those three, you know, in and around the kind of Northwest area would, you know, would provide you with some phenomenal insight. Far more than me just waffling. <laughs> Don't be daft. Real good stuff come out of today. Look, no, again, I, I think you could probably get yourself an early night tonight in terms of all the stuff you've been doing recently. But look, massive thank you, mate, for taking up, um, you know, time out of your schedule to have a chat. No, no. Um, welcome, I don't think we do it enough, if I'm honest. No. Um, but it's been an absolute pleasure today, mate. Obviously, stay safe during the rest of the lockdown. Um, I hope you and the family stay well, and uh, I look forward to catching up with you soon, mate. You, you too, mate, and to everyone listening. Hopefully, you know, stay safe, chill out, consolidate, reflect, and we'll, we'll be all right. We'll be all right in the long run. I appreciate it as well, Martin. You know, taking your time and putting this on for people—it's a great thing. So, thank you as well. Thank you. Oh, it's, well it's, it's my absolute pleasure, mate. Thank you very much. Top man. Speak soon, pal. Take care. Bye. DuckTig brand is on hand for all of your coaching needs. Whether it be to plan sessions or take notes whilst observing games, DuckTig are able to cover all of your needs. Use the discount code AVINE20 at checkout to receive a discount.